Good evening, um, everybody. Thank you for coming. Uh, just to remind you, we are in the chapel, the uh, not permanent chapel because of the works in the, in the church. So we have our Lord uh, among us. So this is, in my eyes, a, a grace for me uh, to be in his sacramental uh, presence. And I hope it's also for all of us, so it helps us to enter deeper into uh, understanding um, the chapter that we will address today. So if you don't mind, before starting, I would like just to um, pray, a um, short prayer, in order to enter in the spirit of uh, today's um, chapter and today's teaching. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. <coughs> Thank you Lord for giving us this opportunity to have your presence among us. Give us graciously your Holy Spirit. Guide us from within. Give us your light, your discernment. Incline our will toward yours. Show us the way. Show us the way through the intercession, the powerful intercession of Our Lady and the intercession of the Blessed Father Marie Eugène. And we pray you asking for the intercession of Our Lady, who is always present among us. <coughs> Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and in the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, <coughs> and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. If my voice goes a little bit down, please just remind me, just doing this in the back, so I could raise my voice um, louder. Um, <coughs> thank you for having me. Thank you, for Monique and Odile, for inviting me to um, this year uh, to explore uh, this big work, very important work, uh, that the Blessed Father Maria Jean uh, wrote for all of us this work called I Want to See God. I keep the French uh, title that encompasses both volumes, but in fact the early edition in French and, and the actual edition, the only edition in English we have, has two volumes. So the first one is I Want to See God, and the second one is, I am the daughter of the church. But since few years in France, we adopted one book. Uh, here you have the la last edition. So, and it has only the title of the first volume, which is, I want to see God. In French, je veux voir Dieu. Okay? Uh, this work is a prophetic work, as I had the opportunity to present it, or to talk, to present rather, uh, Father Marie Eugene a few months ago uh, downstairs here at the Carmelites uh, Priory. This work is of great importance because it comes from a holy man who has and had the experience of what he was explaining and presenting. And I think that this point is very important for us today. Um, theology, spiritual theology more precisely, or spirituality, um, sometimes tends to become a brainy work rather than uh, a science at the service of what the grace of God, what the Holy Spirit is doing uh, in us. And to establish the connection between what um, the teaching we can have and uh, the experience is of utmost importance and it is embodied in him. 
Uh, he died in 68, so he's, I would say, to a great extent, quite modern, even though his writing belongs to the first century, the first part of last century's uh, theology, which is called Neo-Thomism. But still, still, we sense constantly the presence of a man who lived in our time, who witnessed the First World War, the Second World War, as a soldier, the first, both of them, which is quite, I would say, impressive. A very uh, deep human experience for six or seven years, if I'm not wrong, the First World War. Uh, so that that's, that's, um, tells us how close he is uh, from us. Father Marie Eugene starts to give uh, talks uh, in the early uh, 30s and continues <coughs> to uh, lay people what will become very quickly or became, was already starting uh, to be the Institute um, uh, of Notre Dame de Vie. Uh, so it's a, it's a secular institute. Uh, you, you become consecrated, but you live a normal life um, um, in the world with a job. But of course, you have a formation. So he, he, he had in mind, I would say, everybody, not religious people, not only consecrated people, not priests only, but he had in mind everybody. Um, people who live in the world, people who struggle in the world, people he, he met and lived with, at least if we think of uh, his long experience in the First World War. So, <coughs> when he wrote his book, he had in mind all of us. And this is the reason why we make an effort to read his book. Um, maybe for some, not always easy. This is why we have these uh, uh, moments together to sort of ease the way and enter deeper in uh, his great work. Today's choice, um, um, these um, uh, talks will be uh, um, offered between uh, Father uh, Kevin and uh, myself, so um, once a month, so normally. So next month, hopefully, you'll have Father Kevin, then the following, uh, etc. Okay? So this month, um, I, um, the, the plan was already made, so I just simply uh, followed, obeyed. Um, this uh, month was uh, the beautiful chapter uh, called The Wisdom of Love. The Wisdom of Love. You find this uh, chapter um, in the uh, third part, third part, first chapter. Third part of the book, uh, first chapter. I will talk about parts, not the volumes, uh, just to go quicker. Now, <coughs> this book, this chapter, sorry, in this chapter, Father uh, Marie Eugene will talk about the loving wisdom of God or the wisdom of love. Uh, I found that the translator into English um, was struggling a little bit to translate the French expression. Mm? Uh, uh, in French, the original is in French, so forgive me if I um, refer to the French also. Um, it says, uh, la sagesse d'amour. La sagesse d'amour. Da is of. Um, so probably the translator found it a bit odd to translate uh, the wisdom of love. So sometimes it is totally changed. Uh, it, you don't even have love in the, in the sentence. You'll have divine wisdom, uh, something else, not, not uh, with the wisdom of love. Just bear in mind that almost all the time when the wisdom is mentioned in this chapter, uh, Father Mary Eugene uses the expression, wisdom of love, because he considers that all what the wisdom of God when the wisdom of God is acting um, in us and through us, is done out of love and pours love in us and asks us to g transmit this love to others. So that's, that's just for the, the title. Um, now I would like to situate this chapter in the entire work. And I think that this is, this is important. It might take a little bit of time, but I think it is of utmost importance. 
In the beginning of this third part of the book, Father Marie Eugene performs a big shift. He moves on from the first two parts to a completely different world. So, let us explore what this new world is all about. Remember that the entire structure of the book is following the uh, book of the interior castle uh, of uh, St. Teresa of Avila. So, remember that the structure of the book of Teresa of Avila, which is a work of maturity, she wrote it late in her life, so she had all the wisdom, balance, um, uh, and uh, greater accuracy in, in the way she expressed it, and it is very much structured. So remember that this work presents us a journey within ourselves. She represents the human being as a castle, and this castle has different mansions. From the outer mansions to the most inner mansion. The most inner mansion is where Jesus himself lives, dwells. Because we are baptized, we already have Jesus in the deepest part of our being. But where are we? Are we inside or are we rather in the outer mansions? So this book is a journey. Of course it was written initially to her nuns, but she had in mind also all of us. All of us. So the journey starts from the outer part of the castle, entering the castle, and walking through the castle. But of course it's not a walk. It's a transformative journey. So please try to avoid only a 3D or 4D, if you add time, uh, a dimension in, in this, this journeying or in the castle. It's a matter of transformations. These are stages of transformation, not just uh, exploring a house uh, or a castle as you would do physically. You see, you see what I'm trying to say? So the person is very different, is changing from one mansion, one uh, type of mansions, plural, to another type. So the first mansions, plural, second mansions, third mansions, until you reach the seven mansion, singular. Okay? You follow me? So, Father Mario Jean, when he thought to transmit and give the Carmelite spirituality to the world, he chose, this is his choice, to structure his presentation of the entire spirituality following the same structure of St. Teresa of Avila. So, in a way, but it's not totally that, but in a way, his work is a, a commentary, a comment on the interior castle. But it's way more than that, way more than that. It's very rich, and I still think that we need, like, I don't know, 100, 150 years at least to say, well, we maybe started to digest what he, what he wrote. Okay? So, you know, it's very prophetic what, what, what he, he writes. Now, in St. Teresa's work, and I remember very well many years ago, I was in the south of France, I was with the um, Camelites, the French Camelites in the south of France at Montpellier, and I had the grace of meeting uh, old fathers, venerable old fathers, who knew Father Marie Eugene. And one of them, they, unfortunately they're all now in the, with the eternal father. Uh, <coughs> but <coughs> one of them, Father Bernard, uh, Bernard Gabriel, who knew very well uh, Father Mayogène, uh, pointed out uh, something, and this stayed in my mind. He said, one of the great characteristics, he didn't say genius, but today I would say genius, point in, in Father Mayogène is that he understood the transitions between one type of one series of mansions to the following one. He understood the physiognomy of the mansions. The mansions. So for instance, uh, you have, uh, how do you say, uh, pair and pair, o odd and? Even. Evens, thank you. So odd and even uh, 
uh, you have mentions one, two, three, four, five, seven. So you have odd numbers and even numbers. So when you are with the uh, even ones, like uh, two, four, and six, it's like an effort. You are producing an effort and you are climbing. But then with the uh, odd ones, like for instance, five or three, you are more on a, s a sort of like a plateau, like a stabilized situation, stabilized uh, state. Not totally, but rather that. Plus, he understood also the transitions from one mansion to the other. For instance, here precisely today, we are at the transition between the third mansions, and I would say even the first three mansions, and all the following ones. Four, five, six, and seven. So, remember, I'm trying to introduce you to the junction to understand why, right now, he is starting to talk about the wisdom of love. This is done on purpose. He is structuring the, his work following the spiritual growth. So he is very much focused on a human being, the grace of God working in a human being, and watching it develop and change. And remember, it's not, his reference is not only Teresa of Avila. His reference is also the people he meets. The nuns he follows, he, he offers spiritual direction, lay people. Of course, first and foremost, the members of the Institute. You follow me? Now, what is, what is happening here between the first three mansions and the following four? This shift is very important. Teresa of Avila talks about this shift, this change. She says, if you open the first lines of uh, the fourth mansions, she says, now the supernatural starts. Of course, the supernat supernatural here is a word, is a theological word used here. It has nothing to do with the, uh, I would say, daily use in the, in the English uh, language. Supernatural means uh, a new way of acting coming from God. A personal and direct way of acting from God. This is what it means. It's beyond what we can do with the normal uh, grace. It is something, it's like, if you prefer, like a direct in, um, personal intervention of the Holy Spirit in us. Okay? So Teresa of Avila says, here starts the supernatural. Teresa of Avila, in different places, in three different places, I can give you the quotes later on, uh, in a book of her life, if you, if you want, chapter 14, uh, paragraph 6, she talks about something that is fundamental, and it, this distinction between the two ways of acting of the grace of God is mentioned from the first lines of this chapter. The general help of the grace of God and the particular help of the grace of God. Teresa of Avila, in the chapter 14 in the book of her life, paragraph 6, she says, book of her life, autobiography, she says, it is very important to know the difference between the general help of the grace of God and the particular help. And she adds, she says, many people, for not knowing the difference, lose a lot. So you see how sometimes ignorance is not bliss. Ignorance could be very damaging. And on the contrary, some knowledge is important in order to know how to correspond to this new work of God in us this new way of acting uh, of God in us. Now, to make things more approachable to us, what this, is this change all about? He talks about it in the previous chapter, and I do invite you to not just to read one chapter, I hope you, you will read this one at least, but to read also the previous chapter and understand from where he comes. The previous chapter is the end of part two, and it's the end of if you prefer, uh, the, the third mansions. And in this chapter, Father Maria Eugène, quoting Teresa of Avila, Saint Teresa of Avila, says the following. He says, this person is serving God. This person knows God. He's, talk, he's describing being a person in the third mansion. This person is a true believer. This person is avoiding sin. 
But he adds something very important, and I think it's essential, and you find it, it's a quote from Teresa of Avila. He says, this, uh, this person is too much under the control of his or her mind. The queen here is the mind, not the grace of God. And this is very important. So, one can be very dedicated, as a Christian, as a Catholic, offering a lot of uh, help here and there in the parish or whatever community uh, the person belongs to, but still, the person is in control of his or her life and not have, the person hasn't yet experienced that love, that personal and direct action of God where the love of God touches the human being. Hence, we talk sometimes about a second conversion. No, we talk sometimes people, oh, I, I discovered uh, uh, Jesus. Well, of course the person knew before that Jesus existed. But there is a huge difference between talking about Jesus, reading about Jesus, even serving Jesus, knowing that he's there, and meeting Jesus. Do you see the difference? Do you see the difference? I think we are more used to these uh, uh, allusions or, or this, this reality to, uh, today uh, in the church. But we still always uh, need to hear about it. So, Father Mario Eugène says that the wisdom of God haven't, hasn't yet touched the person. So the shift here, when we enter in this new phase, when we enter in the fourth mansions, he feels compelled to talk about what? To talk about the wisdom of love. Why? Because essentially, and, and I'm quoting him in this actual, in our chapter today, uh, that the first thing and the essential thing that the wisdom of love uh, gives us is love. Is the uh, experience of, of the love of God. Okay? Now, Understanding that now God is taking over in our life. We are not the master who decides what to do, what not to do. We feel that there is a call from Jesus. He is entering in our life and wanting he, he wants then to lead us. We can resist, of course. We can go backward, of course. The, uh, remember... Uh, walking through this journey of the mansions of the interior castle, you go forward and you go backward. There is no safe area. Even if you reach the seven mansions, according to Teresa of Avila, no? uh, this is where she would mention the sins of Solomon, no? uh, when he uh, married the other uh, women and he worshipped their gods, not, not the true God. So you see, so <coughs> there is no safe place. Uh, uh, in, in a way. Of course, there is growth, there is transformation, but to a certain extent, we then never lose our freedom. The, the closer we draw to God, we don't lose our freedom, paradoxically. Of course, we are transformed. Of course, if you have a, a strong friendship with somebody, it is more difficult to betray this person. Do you follow me? No? So, of course, there is a change, but still, we are free, free people. Mm? Okay, now, so, Father Mario Jean, introducing this chapter, says we move now on to the particular help of the grace of God. He could have said uh, the supernatural, as St. Teresa of Avila states in the first paragraph of um, the fourth mentions. <coughs> he chose also to focus a lot on the wisdom of love. The wisdom of love. So, this is how the chapter starts. He starts an exploration in the Old Testament and the New Testament of the wisdom of love. He quotes a lot extensively the uh, Old Testament. You might be surprised. Uh, why is he quoting the Old Testament? We haven't had yet Jesus. We didn't have the Holy Spirit. So why would you talk about the wisdom of God? And remember, there are many books, the books of wisdom in the Old Testament, where the wisdom is described even. And he quotes extensively these passages. I won't read them, I invite you to read them. 
but not to read them as if you are reading something from the Old Testament. And I think this is one of the points I would like to uh, leave you maybe when we finish to, to discuss maybe in small groups. This is, I think, one of the points, possible points you may choose, which is to see that, or better, to notice in Father Mario Jean that he says that it's the same wisdom. That the, the, the one who that is described in the Old Testament and the one that he sees in action in the human being is the same wisdom. Which means what? Which means that the Old Testament is in a way new here because the Old Testament offers us a description of something we are supposed, or somebody, we are supposed to experience now. Do you follow me? So, he is opening for us the Old Testament. He's showing us and, and he's following the tradition of the church, by the way. This is not his way. This is a way used from day one in the, in, in the church. Uh, I won't give you a course on that, but I'm just reassuring you that this is very normal in the, in the church. Uh, I would add even something just for your information. It's not in the book, but this is me explaining how it is received in the church. Usually, usually, the word wisdom in the Old Testament you have the Book of Wisdom, you have the Book of Proverbs, uh, Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes, etc. The word wisdom has always been interpreted in two ways by the Church. The first and the most important, the most secure one, is that it alludes to the Son of God, the second person of the Trinity, who became man, but he is the wisdom of God. So there is a tradition about that. In this chapter, it's interesting to notice, Father Mario Eugène doesn't mention that point. He avoids it. In another chapter, he does mention it. So he knows that this tradition. But he chose to focus on something different. But I think it's important for you, for your own culture, spiritual, theological culture, to know that this is normal. The second use is to translate wisdom by Our Lady. Because wisdom is feminine in Hebrew, feminine in many languages. In his language, French, la sagesse, is, is feminine. So you read also uh, Our Lady. But he doesn't do that, but he certainly knows uh, about that. This is just for you, for your own culture. Now, let us leave that uh, for a second. Now, Father Mario Jean, going through different texts, and I invite you to read them and meditate, as not as an intellectual operation, but rather as a nourishment, as food for you. You want to know how God acts, but this wisdom that is supposed to enter in a personal and direct way in our life, here is the description of, of this wisdom. So it's very rich, it's very beautiful. Mm? Okay? Now, so I, I leave that now. After a description, a long description, way longer than uh, the uh, New Testament uh, uh, description in the Old Testament are of the um, wisdom uh, of God. He moves on to um, another point. So that was, if you want, what is the wisdom of love? I will just read one passage uh, for you just to clarify how he sees wisdom. Loving wisdom is not, properly speaking, a divine person. He could very well have said this is the second person of the Trinity, and nothing wrong, he says it elsewhere. But here, his perception of it is different, and we need to pay attention to his perception. She is the three persons. God. Triune God. The Trinity that dwells in our soul. The Trinity that dwells in our soul. And whose single operation, this is what he wants to underline in this chapter, single operation. Of course, he will talk about the Holy Spirit. He will say that we need to know that the first action of the, of the wisdom of God, this is the following chapter, by the way, you can read it, eh? the following chapter. He will say the wisdom of God manifests itself th through the gifts of the Holy Spirit, the seven gifts. So you see, the connection is there. But he prefers to say single operation, single operation. The Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit are working 
they are one and they are working in a, in a, in a unique way, in a, in a one way, in, in us. Okay? And whose single operation conveys her, and he is quoting here a book of wisdom, chapter 7, uh, verse 27, conveys her into holy souls and maketh the friends of God and prophets. So you see, the wisdom of God wants to draw closer to us. And he quotes another and beautiful passage from the Old Testament where it says that God finds his joy amongst the sons of men. This is a very important uh, quote that is constantly present in the mind of Teresa of Avila and Father Marie-Jean quotes it various times and quotes it uh, even here. Okay, I won't read because if uh, otherwise I would transform the, the talk into just reading. I'm, I'm trying just to, to explain. So the wisdom of God finds its joy in us. Here, this is a man of experience, Father Mayorjin, who is, who is quoting this. So when he says it, he knows by experience, by, through his personal experience of the wisdom of God, how God loves to dwell in us and loves to deal in us. Further, in this chapter, he will say that the only work of the wisdom of God is to prepare in us, and in the church, and uh, in the saints, etc., et a dwelling place for herself. The main goal, it, this is one passage, no? Of, the, of wisdom, is to prepare a dwelling place for her in us. Why? Because she finds her delight. God finds his delight in us. So please, let us remember that when we deal with God, that God is pleased and wants to be, our, our, to be with us, to dwell in us. He wants this relationship. It's not just uh, a distant thing. It's a very a personal, intimate uh, uh, thing in God. Now, let us move on to the following point. <clears throat> what... This is B in the chapter, you have A and B. B, what does the wisdom of love do? So he wants to understand how the wisdom of love works. What is the goal of the wisdom of love? Okay. And very surprisingly here, instead of saying what I just said earlier on, just um, less than a minute ago, which is, God rejoices in the fact of, uh, of, of d in, in dwelling in us, finds his delight uh, to dwell uh, among us, in our heart, in our being. He will surprise us here, Father Marijin, by saying that the goal of the wisdom of God is the church. It's a bit frustrating, no? Because you expect you, yourself, to be the goal. Um, he will clarify that, but it's, 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 it's important. No, why am I, am I saying this? Because classically, how would you present spiritual life? You will say the goal of spiritual life is union, is union with God. Now, if you talk to a Carmelite or to John of the Cross or Teresa of Avila and say, what is the goal of, of spiritual life, of our life here on earth? The answer is quick, immediate, sharp, is union with God. No discussion, no? And here you have... I will say a saint, no, because he's blessed, so he's on his way to be declared saint one day. No, I'm not, of course, uh, rushing things, no, <laughs> don't, don't get me wrong, uh, it's not my, my job to do that. But here you have a saint who says what? Who said no, he doesn't say no, but in a way, he insists a lot on saying no, the goal of the wisdom of God is the church. It's to build the church. And who is the church? He doesn't say it, but who is the church? Of course, it's all of us. But all of us here, hopefully we are uh, with the Lord. But imagine how many billion don't know uh, the world. So you won't sleep anymore if you are uh, dealing with the wisdom of God. Why? Because the wisdom of God will say, look, there is a billion and more of Chinese who never heard about Jesus. Can you sleep? This is me talking, it's not him. Eh? Don't, don't, let us not mix things. This is me talking, not Father Marie Eugene. But I think he would agree. 
I don't want to force him to agree, but I think he would agree, no? Would you sleep in the, in, uh, at night if you know that a billion never heard of Jesus? So you understand that he says the goal is the church, and, but what is the church? What we have today is a little church, but the church is all human beings who are created and saved by Jesus, who needs to know Jesus. So you understand that when, and I'm, now I'm joining him, his thoughts, that when the uh, wisdom of God works in us, of course, the first goal is to unite us to her or to God himself. But immediately, it's not just to dwell on a comfortable chair and say, yes, I reached union with God, and that's it. No. She pushes us, she transforms us into an instrument of God's love, of her wisdom, the wisdom of love, in order to spread that love. So. There is here, I would say, a revolution. I'm talking from uh, my own background, being specialized in spiritual theology. You, and I said it a few months ago, um, downstairs, we were there. Uh, this is a revolution. If you check all the manuals uh, during his time, centuries before him, what do, they, uh, what do they offer as a goal in spiritual life? They won't say the church. Nobody will mention the church. They will say, you reach union with God. You reach God. And that's it. You see what I'm trying to say? So here, there is an adjustment. He says things between the line. He's saying things never stop at the union with God. Union with God is a stage where the wisdom of God transformed us into a living instrument of that love to, in order for it to be spread all around the world. Do you, fo do you follow his, his thought? Hmm? This is his thought. This is his, he insists a lot. You can read it. He addresses this issue twice. At this junction, beginning of B1, and then toward the end of the chapter, you have uh, many, uh, more than one paragraph, where he comes back and insists, saying the goal of everything is the church. Okay? Now, having said the goal of everything is the church, and he, by the way, he's quoting a saint, Saint uh, Epiphanius, a Greek bishop of the fourth century, hmm? reputed for his uh, holiness and learning. This expression, no, the goal of everything is, is the church. It's a bit, looks a bit odd where if you don't understand what, what is meant behind it. Okay? Now, the following point, which is B, uh, still B1, but it's, it's B11 and then B12 now. He underlines something very interesting, and this will be a constant in all his presentation of the teaching in spiritual life. He will show us that despite the fact that the, the uh, wisdom of God is a matter of experience, but he will underline a lot the obscurity of the action of God. It's not clear black and white, it's not a powerful sun uh, showing everything, no. And he takes few examples showing us in different saints how initially they thought about something, but in fact God used them for something completely different. They were convinced that God wanted this, but in fact God wanted something way bigger, way different, you see, from what they, they, they were doing. So, underlining the obscurity shows that the entire journey is still a journey of faith. It is a journey where we need faith in order to access God. In the beginning, in the middle of the transformation, and in the end of it. That's very important, and he underlines this constantly. Constantly. This is uh, not just here, but uh, everywhere. So please remember um, this important aspect of spiritual life. Yes, there is experience, but the experience is not that clear, that powerful, that uh, not powerful, that um, palpable, tangible, if you prefer. Uh, there is the element, a fundamental element of a certain uh, darkness, a certain, uh, of course, the need for, for faith. Okay? Now, after, right after that, he will, in uh, number, 
number two. So we are B2. The title is She Orders All With Love. The wisdom of God orders everything with love. With love. After having mentioned this aspect of mystery, of shadowy, uh, of the need of, for, for faith, he moves on to describe three phases of the action of um, uh, the wisdom of God. He doesn't reveal it, but in fact he is offering us the structure of his book. Again, because he does it in, ma in, many, in man many ways uh, before and, and after. He divides this section in three moments. First, he will talk about the love of God, that the wisdom of love is pouring in us. So that's a lovely beginning, if you want. Mm? Uh, we are talking of a direct personal experience of God. We are not talking about the previous uh, stages, as I mentioned earlier on. After that, he will mention, I would say, the difficulties, the struggles, the suffering, the combat, or warfare, if you prefer that the wisdom of God uh, makes us go through. So it's not something we take for granted, it's not something easy, but in order to allow God to purify us, allow the wisdom of God to have more access to us, I don't like the word control, but you understand what I'm trying to say, to, to be more, uh, for us to be more docile to uh, her action, uh, there are difficulties and struggles. Mm? Difficulties and, and struggles. Let me read it. There is a law of strife and of interior and exterior suffering that follows. Here below, below on earth, all the developments and triumphs of the wisdom that is love. So there is a law of strife and of interior and exterior suffering that follows. Mm? He talks about combat. He talks uh, about the wisdom of God being like the lamb amongst the wolves. And this is a little bit our, our life. When we start to follow Jesus, uh, we feel sometimes that, uh, yes, we have to be pure, well, we have to be kind, we have to be the, the, the lamb, but in fact we are surrounded by uh, uh, the wolves. So uh, there, is a f there is a combat, there is a, a battle, and of course there is victory. And he will talk about uh, victory. Now, the final, the final part as I said, he's following, I would say, he's dividing almost the entire work in, in what, what starts from the, the fourth mentions in three parts. No, the, the love of God poured in us, then the difficulties, uh, the, the trials, etc. And then he ends with the third part, mm, uh, which is, let me read it for you. <coughs> Sweet and painful, the wisdom of love is essentially active. This activity is not merely tran transient. It is abiding. God loves us constantly. He doesn't love us because we deserve to be loved. This is me talking, but I'm following his thought in other places, no? God doesn't love us because we deserve to be loved. God loves us because he is love. He is an outpouring of love. And he makes us similar to him also. If love ceased for one instant to communicate itself, it would be no longer love. This is why he doesn't like to stop everything at the union with God. He wants to push us uh, forward. So that's the second point. If you want, we, you might discuss after when we finish, uh, we might choose, uh, is around that, that idea, you know, that the church is the goal, that what the wisdom of God wants to achieve is not just union with God, but to, to use that wisdom, wisdom of God and be us being transformed in her to continue that outpouring, not directly, but through us, through us, like Jesus. He will say in the end that the best example of this work of God is Jesus himself. And he says, look how the wisdom of what the wisdom of God did with Jesus himself. His suffering in, in the garden, his crucifixion, uh, Look what the wisdom of God di did with him. Why? Because he was working for our salvation. So now the wisdom of God will do the same. Hmm? Will do the same with us. So, brace and prepare. Now, <clears throat> now, the 
the last, yeah. Yeah, the, 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 in continuation with this, as I said, he's showing us the, the example of the Lord himself and how and what the wisdom of God did with the Lord himself. The wisdom of love has only one design. For I'm reading toward the end of the chapter, page three, uh, 337. The wisdom of love has only one design for the realization of which she employs all the resources of her wisdom and her power. A single end that explains all her works and that is the church. The masterpiece of, wi of the wisdom of love is, is incontestably, sorry for my pronunciation, the sacred humanity of Christ. And this humanity united to the word, the word, the eternal word of God, mm, uh, by the bonds of the hypostatic union, marvelously adorned with all the gifts. He is describing Jesus, but he has in mind what will happen with each one of us if we follow that journey. Adorned with all the gifts in possession of the beatific vision, even here below, the wisdom of love delivers it up to suffer the agony of Gethsemane, to die in the death of the cross, to be the bread of life, to be nourishment, food, for those she wants to conquer. So you see, the wisdom of God is pushing us after at that stage more and more, while, whilst we are united with, with her, with God pushing us to conquer more people. Uh, remember Jesus say, saying to his apostles, I make you uh, fisher, fishers of, of, of men. Okay? Now, going further to show the, the, the depth and the beauty of the realization, uh, what, what uh, the wisdom of God realizes in us, he says, she wants, she being the wisdom of God, she wants to prepare an altar in, in us, to offer us up to the glory of God, and cause to spring from our wounds floods of light and of life for souls. Now, um, here ends my uh, uh, presentation. So I see uh, it was very uh, interesting to, to share and discuss and have a good conversation on spiritual things. I think we, we need to have more of that in our life, no? To have uh, friends with whom we can talk about spiritual life. It's so rare, so I think we need to treasure that and uh, create also f uh, friendship, spiritual friendship. Now. <coughs> I mean, fr friendship in spiritual life, it can be just normal friendship. No? Now, <coughs> um, before I, I, I maybe um, I listen to one or two uh, of you, I just want to mention uh, uh, one thing. Um, there is a beautiful chapter. If you really have time, I invite you to read another chapter of, uh, from Father uh, Marie Eugène's book, that gives us, I would say, more practical guidance about how the wisdom of God works. Of course, one would rather read the entire work, but I, I will indicate uh, a first chapter which is in the fourth part, I think it's the second book, the second volume. Fourth part, chapter seven. He will talk about the interior light and the providential events in our life, how they are, I would say, the hands of the uh, wisdom of love, manifestations of the wisdom of love. So please don't hesitate to read that. I find this chapter very beautiful, very insightful, unique. Uh, very rarely mentioned by the commentators, but I found it one day and uh, I, I, I appreciate it a lot. And for people who practice 
uh, Lexio Divina, you will find that it's a little bit of Lexio Divina, as we say in French, avant la lettre, which is, means like before talking about Lexio Divina, that's the contents, the deepest contents of Lexio Divina, especially when he talks about the inner, uh, the interior light, hmm? the interior light. So it's chapter, uh, f uh, fourth part, chapter seven, okay? Now, there is another chapter that you may want to read if you have more time, which is the following chapter of today's chapter, which is on the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit. In the eyes of Father Marie Eugène, the implementation of the work of the wisdom of God happens through the action of the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit. Uh, you cannot just take one chapter and separate it from the rest. It's impossible. In the mind of the author, in maybe in our mind, it's easier. But in the mind of an author, it's, it's all interconnected. So this is why, hence, you have me to help you see uh, the, all the, some of the connections, not everything, I don't know everything, but uh, some of the connections, okay? And this is a, a very insightful connection. Father, Father Marie-Eugène is, Marie is extremely attached to the Holy Spirit. He calls him his friend. And the doctrine, the teaching on the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit, in his eyes is very important. So, and he sees that it's like the extension of the action or, or the manifestation of the action of the wisdom of God. So this is the following chapter of the one we are uh, uh, reading uh, today. Uh, where, where is it? Which one? I'll tell you. It's part three, chapter two. Part three, chapter two. Sorry, I work with parts and not with volumes. There are other moments where the wisdom of God is mentioned but you need to bear in mind that the entire book is permeated by this action of God. Because remember, the wisdom of God starts to take us, I would almost say, and work with us from that moment on. So she enters in the scene. It's like you are uh, watching a theater and then suddenly you have somebody who's new you didn't see before in the actors. This is a new actor and this actor will never leave you anymore. You see? So the entire work after that is under her action. Okay? Now, I want to listen to you. Who would like to, I don't know, voice a point that you discussed, um, that you would like to clarify, that maybe you felt you, it wasn't misunderstood, or simply if you want to share something. We have just two minutes. We started to discuss um the transition between the third and the fourth mentions, like you said, we wanted to really know what is it that um, allows you to go from the third to the fourth, if you like. What the question, of course, that's not the chapter, but a legitimate question. What is that allows us to move from the third mansion to the fourth uh, mansions? That's um, Father Marie Jean uh, tends to quote Teresa of Avila and say, and it's a beautiful quote, by the way, he, he, you need even to read it in Spanish because she writes in Spanish. She doesn't write in French and we are now working in English. So it's like <laughs> three languages we are traveling through. In Spanish, she says the following. She says that love, el amor, hasn't yet Sacar de razón, to take the human being out of his mind, to the point that many translators use uh, to lose it, to, to become crazy, she, the, the f a folly, a holy folly, mm, a holy craziness. So the love of God hasn't touched yet the human being or has, wasn't able yet to allow the person hmm, to lose a little bit the control. Uh, Father Marijin insists a lot. She says that the, he says that the mind is totally in control of this good Christian Catholic person. No, I'm pushing it. No, hmm? uh, the mind is totally in control here. Well, he says, what is lacking? I'm, un I'm trying to answer your question. What is lacking here is that the experience of the love of God didn't free the person to the point of abandoning a little bit this ordered and uh, very rational 
uh, way of, of doing things. So the mind, in a way, loses the control. And Father Marie-Eugène does it. I'm talking, this is uh, the previous chapter. You can read the previous chapter. He says the following. He quotes St. Paul. St. Paul, in the first letter to the Corinthians, talks about what? The folly of the cross, of Jesus' cross. He says, uh, this is Marie Eugène, says, mm, uh, the God's f folly is, is uh, the cross is not foolishness. It's not to be crazy. Uh, it's only seen as crazy to us sinners, limited, with a small mind, uh, etc. But usually it shouldn't be perceived like that. Mm. So it's the consequences of, of, of sin, etc. So I think that the experience, I'm trying to answer your question, the experience of Jesus' cross, where evil is transformed in a higher, into a higher good, the experience that evil doesn't have the final say, the experience that when Jesus is asking me to forgive, and I, the experience that I can't forgive, I don't have the means, I would like to, but I can't. So I feel that I'm stuck. What happens? I shout. And then the shift could happen, which is the experience of this direct and personal action of, of God, uh, of the Holy Spirit. And just to complete that, the, your, the answer deserves, I, I, you, the question deserves more, more longer answer, but I just want to mention something that it is very common to cross from the third to the fourth. Very common, more than can you, you can imagine. Whenever a person is committed to follow Jesus, whenever a person felt the call, not necessarily to follow him like in religious life or whatever, but to follow him in, in your actual state of life, to give everything, to allow him to be the leader, not you, you are crossing from the third to the fourth. It is what we call the second conversion. A Teresa of Avila is an amazing example, and you should read her autobiography. I invite you to do that. Read her autobiography, because she tells the story of that shift from the third to the fourth. He, she spent 20 years as a nun, 20 years as a nun, in the third mansions, struggling to cross from the third to the fourth. Uh, that's, that's a case study, I would say. And I would say it's a case study for the entire church because it's powerful, no? 20 years as, as a nun, you would think that the person already gave everything. And she says, no, we take so long to give everything. This is another point, no? To give everything, to surrender, even from our emotions. And say, God, okay, I'm yours, emotionally, you see? So it's, I think, it's the determination it's feeling, uh, listening to a call, to Jesus' call, personal call, and then putting everything. You know, sometimes if you pay um, a Protestant church visit, evangelical, uh, what is their main point? Hmm? What is the essential point for them? Hmm? To do what? Jesus the Lord. Huh? No, 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 before that, when you enter, when you join, what is the essential thing? What are they expect from you? No, no. Huh? No, 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 no. It's to take Jesus and accept Jesus as your personal savior and to surrender your entire life in his hands. This is crossing from the third to the fourth. With all due respect. That's what they call the altar call. With, with, oh, this is altar call? Apology, I didn't know. Sorry. You see, so what did you do here? You heard a call. And you understood that Jesus wants you totally. So what do you do when it's the right time, when it is mature, when it matures in, in you? What do you do? You say, okay, Jesus, and now I choose you and I'm yours. I heard your call and I choose you. You are crossing from the third to the fourth. So it's about surrendering our entire life in, in, in his hands. Then what happens? We join Father Maria Jen and what? who takes up? Take, uh, who, uh, who is on board now is the wisdom of love who will guide us to what? Union with God and the church working for the church. I'm afraid we have to stop. So uh, we, no, 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 we are in the church. So thank you. Uh, we, we, thank you anyway. Uh, we normally, it's a, it's a very strong tradition.